Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over UFC uh, from Jacksonville for this weekend, and I'm going to be doing it from a DFS perspective. Uh, later on this evening or tomorrow morning, I'm going to be doing the betting breakdown, and it's a really, really good card with respect to DFS. It's a full 14 fight card, at least as of this recording, which is only two days out. Um, hope we do keep all of these. And there's a lot of scoring to be had, which makes it a really, really strong uh, GPP play, uh, card from a, uh, if you want to play a whole bunch of lineups, because there are a, quite a number of options. There are a, a good amount of, of favorites with good inside the distance prop. Uh, there are there's some wrestling upside. There is a mid-range fight, which rates to score incredibly well. And it makes for a very um, a very fun card. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm actually in the live final, which I've spent, looks like, the last six months qualifying for. Um, got through round one, round two, round three. And we're down to 15 uh, entrants, uh, split up among 13 uh, players, actually, because two people have multiple entries. And that's actually being played out in Jacksonville, but unfortunately, due to personal situations, I'm not able to attend, uh, although I am going to be obviously participating. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, my approach to that, although to be quite frank, I don't even have my lineup uh, finalized yet. I have to you know, cross some T's, dot some I's, get a couple, couple more of opinions from podcasts, from people I respect, and uh, just decide what I want to do. But that's not going to prevent me from you know talking about this from a DFS perspective. And um, uh, what we're going to do is first thing is we have to identify the key fight that you probably have to get right. And that is going to be Trevor Peak versus Jose Mariscal. Now, first of all, you look at um, this fight from a uh, – betting perspective you have two minus 110 uh fighters and you have and that's not my lineup that's just a saver um and you have pricing which is you you have no line value because you have where are these prices uh peak and mariscal it's 8200 8k so if the price is being aligned uh quite accurately i mean if you want to be Ultra technical, you can say the Mariscal is a slight bit of line value, but not really. And the thing is, is that the inside the distance prop on this fight is extremely high. Um, to put it in, put a number to it, it is uh, the under one and a half is, is like a minus 130. Um, under two and a half rounds is minus about 300 or so. Fight goes the distance is, you know, it's about minus, fight ends is probably about minus, counting for Vega, about minus about 350 or so. So we're talking about about 70% chance, 75% chance at least that the fight does finish. And you have a fight that's priced this way with 8,208K. It's just extremely likely that whoever wins this fight is going to be in the optimal. Um, and when you break this down by inside the distance props, I mean, you look at peak inside the distance is about a pick em or so. Um, and to put that in perspective, this is the type of inside the distance prop you're going to want if a fighter is 9,000 9, 9, or 9,100. Um, and peak is coming into 8,200, which makes this kind of extremely elite play. And even on the other side, you have Mariscal, who not exactly sure what his inside the distance prop actually is yet, because like one side has him at plus 300 or so, and the other is like plus 200. DraftKings isn't out yet, but I'd have to believe that Mariscal is, you know, if he wins, maybe he's not ex as likely to be in the optimal as Peak, but it's it's pretty, it's pretty close. I mean, I don't really see too many variations where he wins by decision. I mean, here you can see like Mariscal by decision is like plus 600 or so. So you can even do the math and, and figure this out, you know, like uh, this fight's going to be a train wreck. 
you're going to have both fighters going for the throat in the first inning, in the first inning, in the first round. And Keek has, in his last two fights, has he's he's almost lost in the first round in both of them, and then came back to to dominate and win at the end of the first round in one, I think, in the second round in the other. So this fight is 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 all action, uh, and you're just going to have to get somebody from this fight. Uh, I imagine that in the qualifier, I think of the 15 people playing this, I imagine all 15 of them are going to play somebody in this fight. And I imagine that in regular DFS, you're going to want to play hundred percent of this. It's just the way the pricing works is uh, it's, it's just very, very difficult for the winner of this fight to not make the optimal. What I will say is that it is going to be very popular and there are 14 fights. So if you can fade it and get away with it somehow, you're really going to be in tremendous shape. Okay. Like if, I don't know, if somebody gets a DQ or, or somehow this fight goes three rounds and goes to decision, um, you could, and you get away with it by fading it. Yes. You're going to have a big advantage over the field. And also I, I, I think there are chances that, you know, with 13 other fights, you can get the optimal even with one of these guys getting 100 um, and not include them. I mean, there are some 7K fighters that could, that could, you know, outscore these guys, but it just doesn't happen, obviously, as often as these guys outscoring them. Okay. Um, so this is the main fight. I mean, you're going to probably have to play this. I am probably not going to play a hundred percent of it on um, in uh, in MME, just because I think I do want to um, have some builds where I fade it. But it's going to take you honestly till about the twenty fiftieth lineup, I think, or thirtieth at least, before you should be fading this fight. Um, now, one thing I will throw in is that. I think this fight's going to be efficiently owned. I think the peak is the better has the better inside the distance prop. So I think he's going to be more popular. And I think that Mariscal does have a little bit more takedown upside, which makes up for a little of that. But um, I, I really feel as if you're going to get no edge in this fight, you know, whichever one of these guys you take, you're going to be, you know, correctly priced, well, it's correctly priced. You're going to be cor correctly owned with the field, okay? Um, so what you could do, again, is you you could go 100% of it. And this way, you know, if you play 50% peak and 50% Mariscal, you will be ahead of the field on both of them because neither of them are going to be 50% owned. That's just not the way it works. Um, so that is one way you could, you could play it. Um, but it is the key fight. You do have to play both these. Do I have an opinion on this? I mean, not really. Um, okay next thing we're going to just start right now from the bottom and kind of work our way up just to kind of just kind of show you actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to illustrate some of these good favorites that there are out there so like right off the bat you have what might be just the overall best play on the slate okay and we'll talk about this and that would be Cody Brundage so this was Cody Brundage is actually stepping in as a late, you know, late notice replacement um, against Dumas. And he's only taking this on like seven days rest. And usually that it's very rare that the, the short notice replacement ends up favored, not, not to mention you get minus 170. And listen, good on DraftKings for waiting to price this because when this first came out, this fight was first announced. Uh, Brundage was announced at Pickham or close to it. And then all the money came in on him and, and DraftKings did wait to, uh, to price this and they did price it appropriately given the, the win odds at 8,700, 7,500. So there's no win equity here in playing in either of these guys, but look at the inside the distance prop here on this fight. I mean, you have uh first start with Cody Brundage. I mean, he is, it looks like he's like a minus 110 to finish inside the distance, which is, again, that's what you want from a 9K fighter. And you add in that he's got wrestling upside. This is a, a pretty, 
I mean, a pretty elite play if you want to know the truth. Now, again, you're going to, if you watch content and you watch betting break, you're going to hear like stuff that's going to make you not want to play it. You know what I mean? Because you're going to hear that he, he, he can't be trusted that, you know, that, that Dumas had a bad performance, but he's, he's due to come back in this fight. And then that Brundage is like, has no cardio and it'd be, and, and you're going to be really afraid to play this, but based on the numbers themselves, this play is just kind of elite. If you want to know the truth. So Right off the bat, I think Brundage is a really, really super strong play. And, and before we even leave this fight, you look at this inside the distance prop on Dumas. I mean, he's like plus 200. And that's usually what you want to see for like an $8,400 fighter or so. And he is, again, really, really cheap. And he's 7,500. So again, like if, if you watch like the actual breakdown of the fights and you, you, listen, you can get them anywhere. You're, you're going to be wary of playing this in DFS because you're not going to want to try. You're not going to want to play Dumas because he was just awful in his last fight. And you, in his last fight, he was taken down by Josh Brand, who and 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 Brund, and Dumas had just nothing to offer on the ground, like literally nothing. And Brundage is a good wrestler who's probably going to try to take Dumas down. So stylistically, you know, how it's very difficult to play Dumas, but the numbers are, are pretty, pretty strong here. And, and, and from a trust perspective, right. People, I don't trust Brundage. You know, yeah. It makes sense. I mean, he's, you look at his game, you look at his fight log. And he's, he got a takedown on Vieira. Then he just completely gassed. We lost in the second round. He got starched in the first round by all his age up. So, and he did beat Gore, and apparently he was on his hands and knees to beat Lujan Bula, and he got completely ragdolled by Maximov. And you look at these, these, these strikes, I mean, he throws nothing, you know? So you look at these numbers, he's at 20 significant strikes, zero? How do you have zero? And then 15, four, you know, 28? I mean, this is... This is, doesn't appear to be a guy that's that's going to want to score well. However, according to the numbers, he looks he looks pretty damn good. So um, it's gonna it's gonna challenge you to play him. But it, it, boy, oh boy, uh, it, it's 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 a it's a it is a key fight. I mean, I really think this is a key fight. So you already have the peak fight, which I think is a key fight. You have Brundage, which is a key fight, and there's still twelve fights left to go. Um, so we're going to focus on some of these like good looking favorites. So, so let's, let's go to the next one, which is Tiara. So Tatsu, Tatsuro Tyra, he is one of the bigger favorites on the card. Um, is he the second biggest favorite? Like, well, one of them, it's pretty close. He's a minus 270. Um, and again, accounting for VIG, it's also, he's minus 230. So win odds, he, you're expecting to see about 92, 9,300. And you're getting that he's like 9400 and to 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 make a 9400 dollar fighter let's put him in here um a 9400 dollar fighter worth worth it he's got to not only have an inside the distance prop of about pick him but he's also going to have to have takedown and wrestling upside as well um if he doesn't have the takedown upside he's got to be more like a first round finisher like minus 110 and if he doesn't have the takedowns, and if he doesn't have the, the finishing upside, he's got to really, I mean, he's, it's almost impossible to get there just on takedowns. So you need to at least have a combination of this. And, and when you look at the inside the distance prop, you have Tyra, who is, is inside the distance prop is, is fair. It's like plus 115 or so. It's not exactly what you want. And his takedown upside is... I would, and again, this is more qual qualitative. I mean, it's it's good, but it's not kind of like guaranteed. In other words, he's not the greatest wrestler in the world. So it's not as if he's going to string like a whole bunch of takedowns together, followed by a whole bunch of ground and pound. He's a submission guy, which is, I mean, it's good. But what submission guys usually like to do is once they get your back or they get you know get on top whatever they will hunt for the submission and not rack up those you know ground and pound points that add up to that 
what they like, you know, which is takedown upside is that is that described. So I think that the combination of his pretty good but not awesome inside the distance prop, plus his pretty good but not like a lock like takedown upside, I think it makes him a play, but not a a lock, like not something you want to necessarily lock in. Now again, it depends on what type of contest you're in. He's 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 got the you know, he's got a big winning percentage. You know, he's, he's minus 250. So even if he doesn't get the finish, and even if he doesn't get a million takedowns, he could still get, you know, in a win. Like, what's his floor in a win? I mean, 90? I mean, that would probably be the worst, the worst win condition for him. Because he's not, it's not going to be like all on the feet. He's going to probably have to get at least one takedown to win. So I guess that's the worst is 90. And obviously he can get up to 120, I suppose. So I think he's a good play, but it's not something like, okay, let's start with Tyra and and and, and blast. Um, you know, while, while we're thinking about it, let's just go to another kind of big favorite. Let's just go straight. Oh, by the way, so so Rodriguez. Um Rodriguez, unfortunately, see, here's the deal. When you have these plus like 200 underdogs, which is actually it's a little more. But we'll think about it this way. It's probably about 30% to win. The problem is, is that they just don't win too often. And, and, and if you want to play guys like this, you, you want to make sure that if they win, they are almost always in the optimal, right? On cards like this, you know, because, because if it were a card where it was only 10 fights or something like that, and any win would be cool, then I would say, listen, all I care about is the win for these underdogs. But there's just so many points out there, and there's just so many fights that I just don't think it's good enough. The only exception I would I would make is that if the fighter that you're that the underdog is facing is extremely popular, then you can make the argument that you're getting good leverage even in the absence of, of, a, of an incredible win, win odds or incredible finishing upside. So you look at Clayton's, by the way, Clayton's inside the distance prop, I presume it's extremely poor, um, you know, like plus 500 or something like that. So yeah, that, um, which makes me wonder what his win condition really is. Um, on the feet, like a decision on the feet, I guess it's possible. Um, so for me, uh, I'm probably going to be off of Rodriguez here. Um, just to get some Tyra. All right, so let's move on to another um, to some of the other like good favorites. I'm going to get to come at some of the fishier ones in a minute. So let's now go to the Brendan Allen fight. So Brendan Allen is is fighting Bruno Silva, and he's not quite 200. He's minus 180. Silva is plus 140. So we're expecting to see about about 8800 or something like that, right? Um, Maybe that makes sense. And you look at the price. I mean, he, he's a little bit overpriced, I guess. Um, Brandon Allen at 9,100. 9,100 usually, you usually get the two to ones or higher at, at 9,100. But because, again, of linear pricing, because someone has got to be at each kind of range, sort of, um, they, they made him only, they made him 9,100. But plus, only minus 180, that's not the greatest win odds in the world. Um, and for, however, for that price for 9,100, what you'd like to see is an inside the distance prop of, like I said, about pick them or some grappling upside. And fortunately you have some of both here. So Brandon Allen, you have Allen wins inside, inside the distance is, is a very healthy minus 110, maybe even minus 120 in some spots. Um, and that's extremely strong. Um, not to mention the fact that he's got grappling upside. And I think, I think he's going to be, I think he's a really, really good play. You know, I think that he's not as good a play. Well, is he as good a play of Brundage? Let's take a look at this. So his inside the distance prop is the same, same minus 110. The inside, the, the grappling upside, I think is similar. Maybe Brundage might have a little more, but maybe not. And the only difference is, is that, Allen is a little more likely to win, right? Allen is 
minus 180, just looking at his side for a second. Actually, not really. And Brundage is minus 200. So I don't think that Allen is as good a play as Brundage, but he certainly, you know, you, you don't, if, if you watch content, you'll certainly feel a lot more comfortable with him. You know, listen, he's, he's fought main events. He's fought good fighters. He's just beat Andrew Muniz and all this stuff. So people feel more comfortable playing him. Um, so he's certainly in play as a very, very fine favorite. You know, we've, we've gone through several cards now where you really haven't had anybody over 9K, which had these types of metrics. Now we're getting a few of them. So it, it's going to make for an interesting decision uh, across the board here. Uh, on the other hand, so you have Bruno Silva. And this is another, this is a good, this is, this is another kind of battle between between numbers and and uh, content and breakdown because if you watch breakdowns and you watch content and you talk to MMA experts, this is what you're going to hear that Bruno Silva has definite some knockout upside here, meaning that Brandon Allen has been known to get into striking matches where he shouldn't. And he's also been known to, to be prone to be knocked out if he gets involved in that stuff. You know, he got knocked out by Chris Curtis. He got knocked out by Sean Strickland. You know, um, he's certainly coming off of two very, very strong performances. Three, really, he beat Malcoon, Jocko, and and, um, and Muniz. However, none of those guys were particularly strong strikers. Um so if you watch the, the content, you can make a case that Bruno Silva is a very, very strong underdog here because, you know, if he wins, he's almost certainly going to knock out Brandon Allen, right? And at that price, it's he's probably going to be optimal, right? If, if he gets a KO win, Bruno Silva, 7,100, I mean, that's really, really strong. And, and all you need is, is for Brendan Allen to be stupid and to let to get the striking battle for that to happen. However, when you actually look at the numbers here, it doesn't really tell that same story. Like, like and maybe we'll we'll update this when some more props come out, but I guess Silva inside the distance plus 300. That's a that's really not that good. You know, like listen, pl the plus 300s. I mean, they're, they're, when we look at these, usually we think of it as, as guess it's okay. So I guess that's the answer. I guess, I guess it's okay. You know, I, I would have expected it to be more like the Dumas. You know, I, I don't, you have Silva's a plus 150 favor or something like that. Or what's it, and, and I don't, I myself don't see any win condition where he wins without finishing. But I guess he, listen, he, he did take, uh, what's his name, uh, Maybe that's something we're going to talk about bet in the betting breakdown, actually. That could be actually a pretty interesting bet because we did see Silva get into a striking match with, um, with uh, not Israel Asami, with uh, uh, Alex Perheya. And they, and he went to decision and he lost, but he couldn't get, he can play, he could fight 15 minutes to a decision. And if Brandon Allen wants to get into a striking battle or, Let's say it's one of those fights where Allen, um, you know, gets some takedowns in the first round, and then Silva comes back and, you know what I mean, and just just outstrikes him. I don't think this is quite this is so binary. You know, I, I think that that Silva might be able to win a decision here. So, what this means is that, I mean, in his wins, is he optimal? I think m most of the time. But not all of the time. So this is a weird, this is a weird one from a DFS perspective because, as narrative wise, you want to play it, but numbers wise, yeah, I'm just not sure, you know. So, so listen, I am going to play it, um, and I'm probably going to play both sides, but it's I don't think it's a a a must play. Well, let's compare these things for a second. So let, let's compare Silva to Dumas because this is very similar, right? You already said that Brundage is probably a little bit better um, of a play because of the price. Are we going to say the same thing about Dumas? I guess so, because you look at Dumas' is inside the distance prop, and Dumas is plus, you know, what did we say, plus, two, plus 210 or something like that? Where was that? Uh, Dumas by 
inside the distance, plus like 220 compared to Silva's plus 300. You know, I, I, um, maybe I'm splitting hairs here and I think it's pretty much the, the, a similar type of fight. But I do think I think prefer the Brundage Dumas as far as the numbers go. I mean, I think that the Allen, boy, oh boy, I think the Allen, and you think that I've been looking at this card for two weeks now, at least because of this this stupid freaking MMA qualifier thing, this this live final thing, and I still don't know what I want to do. But anyway, I think the Allen Silva fight is certain. Listen, in MMA, you certainly have to play it. Um, but if you're prioritizing, I do believe that the Brundage Dumas fight might be a little bit better as far as the numbers go all right um let's look at uh the final like what i consider really really good favorite and that would be um Ilya Taporia. so in the main event you have Ilya Taporia is the biggest favorite on the card minus 330 depending where you look and even when you account for vivig it's like so he's like three to one so he's going to win the fight about you know 75 percent of the time and his price is is very steep. It's ninety five hundred. So at ninety five hundred, what do you need? Well, you need you need both. You need a, a strong inside the distance prop, where it's at least minus one ten, uh, and you need you're gonna need some grappling upside. Now in this particular situation, I mean his his inside the distance prop is insane, um, insanely good. Is what I meant to say. So Tapuri inside the distance is plus is minus like 240. And I haven't seen that. I don't see that too often. So that in and of itself is probably okay. Is it good enough to, to pay off the 9,500? Not really. I mean, because even listen, if he knocks him out in the first round with, you know, some significant strikes, let's say no takedown, some some significant strikes. Knocks him out in the first round. What is he at? 110? Yeah, I mean, that's good. You know, is, is his ceiling... Here's a question. Is his ceiling any better than Tyra's? I don't think so. Um, because in a weird way, I don't think Taporia is going to play that game where he, he gets a million takedowns and a million... Boy, I was going to say this, and a million minutes of ground and pound, but he might. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like if he, I, I believe that he that he believes he could just win this fight on the feet, and he very well could. And I'll tell you this: if they get into a striking match, I I, I think this fight could bust. You know what I mean? Like if if in fact Zaporia like gets into the full striking match with uh with uh with Emmett. I do think the fight could bust at extremely high ownership for Taporia. Um, but he is the biggest favorite on the card. He does have a strong inside distance prop. So you're just going to have to play him. Okay, now he is going to be low, you know, highly owned. So that's something to consider. But, I mean, him, Tyra, I think they're both just kind of like, they're good. I mean, they're good plays. Now, you'll see, by the way, if you try to play them both, it does become uh, rather, rather touchy. I mean, for example, like if you did want to play Tyra and Taporia, and then you're going to want to play somebody from that, that, that peak fight, right? Even if you played the, the, the cheaper one, you're already down to 7,700 a person. Now, now, you already cannot really access... Oh, there's another favorite I want to get to in a second. Brundage can't access Allen. You can't access him this this last guy, which I want to talk about either. Um, and that would be Justin Tuff. So in this, and we'll we'll get back to Josh Emmett in a second. Um, so Justin Taffa, he is minus 180 against Austin Lane. Uh, it seems familiar, right? So similarly to Cody Brundage, who's minus 175 or so. Similar to Brendan Allen, who's minus 180. These are all priced the same. However, Tafa is less than Allen and a little bit more than Brundage. Okay. Now, at 8,800, all you need, I mean, all you, need you need to be about a plus 130 inside the distance. 
or, you know, a little bit worse, but has a takedown upside. Now, while he does not have any takedown upside, you'll see Tafa has a very strong inside of distance prop of pretty close to pick him, right? Let's see. Um, Tafa inside the distance is a full minus 120, minus 110. So it's the same as, as Brendan Allen, okay? So what's the difference, let's just say, between him and Brundage or him and Brendan Allen? So the difference between him and Brendan Allen is that Brendan Allen's got more takedown upside. I mean, he's got significantly more takedown upside because Tafa has, I don't think, any takedown upside. I didn't say any. I mean, I guess he could get a takedown. He's certainly not going to be going for them on purpose. Um, and when it comes to the difference between him and Brundage, I think it's a similar issue. Uh, they have pretty much the same inside the distance prop, but Brundage has the takedown upside. So I think Brundage is a better play than Tafa. But I think that Tafa being a lower price than Allen makes him just as good of a play as Allen, even though Allen does have more takedown upside. So, um, so I think Tafa is another very, very strong favorite. All right. Now let's circle back to these, to these, uh, to the opponents of these guys. So Emmett, again, like he's plus a lot. You know, he's not going to win the fight all too often. So if in fact, you know, you play him, I mean, he better like get there literally every time. I mean, you really need to get you really need to be optimal because he's just not going to win the fight all too often. Um, so can Emmett get there in like 25% of the time? It's already, it's kind of weak and not make optimal. Yeah. I mean, he could win a decision. I definitely think that Emmett can win a decision. here. So I, I'm, I'm probably not going to get to him. The only thing that you could say is obviously Emmett's got incredible leverage because the is going to be extremely popular. And if he does get like some KO or something like that, yeah, I mean, you're going to want it. And if you do get even like a decision with like 90 points or something, if Tapuri is extremely chalky, which he will be, I guess it's not terrible, but I mean, only in real, real deep stuff am I going to be going for, for Emmett. And on the other hand, you look at Austin Lane in this, in this Tafa fight. I mean, he has a pretty reasonable inside of distance prop of his own. Like Lane is like plus 240 or so. And that is very similar, if I'm not mistaken, to Tafa. And that's not Tafa, sorry, to um who is this thing here? Mon Eric. Uh, Dumas. So this is very similar, right? So Dumas is inside the distance prop. What do we say his was again? Dumas inside the distance plus like 200 plus 210. So maybe Dumas is a little bit better of a play than Austin Lane. Let's look at Austin Lane again. Yeah, Dumas is a little bit better play than Austin Lane also because I think Brundage is probably going to be more popular than Tafa, I think. But I definitely would put Austin Lane in MME bills. Okay, so those were all of the good favorites, right? Um, and now what we're going to look at is is the rest of the card, which are which include some kind of fishy favorites and some a couple of very contentious middling fights. So let's first talk about one of the kind of the fishier favorites. I say fish. I just say fishy from a DFS perspective. So Jamal Emmers versus Jack Jenkins. I mean, he's he's minus 200, which is good, Jamal Emmers. And what's interesting, look at the price. He's only 8,600. So at only 8,600, I mean, he, he actually has some good win equity here, actually. I mean, it, it, usually the minus 200s, we're going to get to some of these others in a second. The minus 200s, are, are going to be much more expensive. So Embers has a has kind of a little sneaky bit of, uh, of of win equity, actually. But I don't think this is the card to be playing win equity. You know, I think you just have to treat it like, okay, what's an 8,600 fighter need? Uh, and 
he doesn't really, he's not really a big grappler here. Um, and his inside the distance prop, you have Embers inside this is like plus 240. That's just not going to be good enough, I don't think. Let's see, Emmers plus two, was it, what did I say, plus 240? Yeah, something like that. Emerson said this is more like plus 250 or so. And then on the other side, Jenkins, I don't really think he's got much wrestling upside, honestly. He had a couple of takedowns, but it wasn't really from his takedowns. He just kind of like just kind of fell on the guy a little bit and threw him to the mat when the other guy went for him. I don't think it's the same. Um, so Jenkins, his he doesn't have much of an inside distance prop at all. So I think this fight is, I think in cash or in like, other stuff, maybe you could play Emmer just because of his win equity. But aside from that, it's, it's probably not a great DFS uh, uh, fight. We talked about Peak. Uh, Juma Gulov, he's another minus 200. Uh, and he is 9,000. So at 9,000, again, what we're looking for are in, inside of distance props of Pick'em and or a great amount of takedown upside. And Zuma Golov has neither. Uh, Zuma Golov inside the distance is plus like 400. I mean, that's just hopeless, you know? And if I knew he was going to completely spam takedowns, I would I would go for it. But I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. So I think he's a fade. And, be, and it's a weird way. Because he's a fade and because, you know, uh, no one's – I don't think anybody's going to play him. Josh Van, unless he himself has a good inside the distance prop – it's probably not worth it because he doesn't have any leverage. I mean, it is interesting. So Van inside the distance is plus 320 or so. Boy, oh boy, that's 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 a little bit surprising. I mean, who would have thought that? So so like put that in perspective. He's plus 320. And Bruno Silva, who I think more I think people are gonna play. I mean, he is what's his inside the distance? He's like plus, yeah, I guess it's better. So, so about plus two seventy or so. Okay, so it's it's uh it's okay. Uh, I, I thought Bam was going to be a good play. It, it's fringy. I'll play him in one fifty, but that's about. It. All right. Um, we'll get to the middle east stuff in a second. Let's talk about the other kind of like semi suspect favorites. So Randy Brown against Wellington Terman, another minus two twenty. Uh, he should be about 90, you know, 9,100 or so. And let's take a look. And he has 9,300. So for 9,300, you're going to need, again, a combination of good takedown upside, which Randy Brown does not have, and a really, really strong inside the distance prop of like minus, you know, at least 110. And if you look at it, it's just extremely poor. I mean, his inside the distance prop is about plus. 140 and in the absence of takedown upside to add to that this is just not going to be playable honestly now he's going to be low owned but i mean there are other options you know i i, I wouldn't i just don't think i would play him uh well he's determined on the other hand um you could argue that he's live if only because of his win condition so he does have some physicality and he is probably going to be going for some clinch and in, in takedowns so I guess in that respect, he makes him kind of a decent underdog. I mean, his inside the distance prop is probably pretty hopeless. Let's take a look. I mean, plus 440 or something like that, you know. So it's extremely fringy underdog. I mean, he's definitely not as good as some of the other ones we've described. Um, okay, another semi-fishy underdog favorite, I guess, as far as DFS goes, is Neil Magny. So he's minus 170 or 160. So I'm expecting him to be about 80, you know, I don't know, 8,500 or so, 86. And that's what we're getting. You're getting Magni 8,500, Brown at, sorry, Rowe at 77. For 8,500, what do you need for Magni? You need, I don't know, plus 240 or something inside the distance. And what do we have here for him? Magni instead of distance, like plus like 500. I mean, it's not the way he wins. He's not really the guy that's going to spam a whole bunch of takedowns. So he's pretty unplayable. And then Philip Rowe inside the distance. I mean, he's actually pretty reasonable. He's like plus 240 inside the distance as an underdog. Um, That's actually not bad. 
That's actually not bad. Row inside the distance plus 240 as an underdog. I mean, he's not a huge underdog, but 7,700, that's not bad. So I, I, I consider actually Row is more playable in this fight than, um, than Magnum. Um, and then the last kind of like semi big favorite, uh, actually there are two more. We'll get to kind of one that's okay in a minute. So let's look at Amanda Rebos versus Macy Barber. So this one you have again, a minus 200. Uh, so again, we're expecting to see about, you know, that nine K ish and we get yeah, 8,900. So she's one of the cheaper of these, of these, you know, minus two to ones. So for her to be playable, she's got to have an inside the distance prop of like about plus 120 and or a wrestling upside. Uh, inside the distance prop, you're not going to really get much out of her here. You have Kibas inside the distance is like plus like 375. You do have some takedown upside from Hebus. Um It's she's not exactly the the ones just have multiple takedowns, though. Let's, let's do a take a look. Let's take a look at her, her game log, actually. Let's put that bit of nonsense to the test here. Two, three, one. She doesn't, doesn't really like to score. Um, here with the two takedowns against Araujo, that was good. eight minutes of control time, 116. I mean, that that's that's gotta be good enough. But aside from that, I mean, I guess it's okay. Listen, an infinitesimal ownership. Uh yeah, I guess so. Uh, I'm not putting in my big buy or anything like that, but I, I definitely feel as though she's um, that she's uh, a good, you know, a real good deep GPP play because she does have enough takedown upside, I think, to get her there. But it's gonna it's gonna be tough. And the last one before we get to the the, the two mid rangers is this uh, Gabriel Santos versus uh, Onama fight. So. You have Onama and Santos again, another big favorite, like minus 230. So he should be about 9,300 or so. And that's what he is, about 9,200. And for 9,200, you need an inside the distance, you need both. You need an inside the distance prop of about minus 110 plus some takedown upside. And you're just not quite getting it. You know, Santos is good with the grappling and wrestling, but it's not like 100% going to go to it. And then his inside the distance prop is, I mean, plus 150. It's just barely on the outside looking in, I think. Okay. Um, again, MME, GDB 150 max, sure. But he's just on the outside looking in as far as the better favorites go. Um, doesn't mean it's not worth playing, especially with ownership discount. But uh, I put him a little bit below these other guys. And again, same problem with Onama. I mean, I don't think that Santos can be that highly owned, so you're not getting leverage there. Onama has no takedown upside. So we're going to need to get there just on the inside the distance prop. It better be at least like plus 270. Or, you know, it's like plus 350. It's just not quite good enough. So this whole fight is like really just, just on the outside looking in. All right, and the last two fights are two kind of interesting middling fights, which I think they could both score. Um, or they could both bust, honestly. Um, and, and they're both been extremely well analyzed, which which, which means that probably not going to get much of an edge on them. Um, but we'll just take a look at it from the numbers. Uh, first, you have Tabitha Ricci and Jillian Robertson. You have you have you know Ricci at minus one thirty, and I presume it makes her about eighty four hundred or so, maybe eighty three. Let's take a look. Yeah, eighty three hundred versus seventy nine hundred. And you have two grapplers. You know, you have you have Ricci who's going to go for wrestling and and try to get takedowns and top control. But then you're going to get uh, Jillian Robertson who is going to try to submit her. Um, and I just don't know which way the fight's going to go. You know, and you're not going to see a good inside the distance prop here. You're going to see probably let's look at both these girls. Robertson inside this is plus three twenty. Ricci inside is plus like 600. I mean, so I, I guess that if they're both going to go for takedowns and Robertson's got the better inside the distance prop, I guess Robertson's a little bit better. Um, but then again, I think I think that the that the Ricci win is going to look more like a, a traditional wrestler win. 
The other thing that Richie could do is just try to keep this on the feed. Um, so I don't think this fight is like a must play. You know what I mean? I think it's kind of an interesting fight to take, you know, take a stab at. And I don't really, I, I guess based on the numbers, I, I think Robertson might be slightly better just because she has more submission upside than Ricci. But then again, Ricci has more just kind of raw wrestling points. So I think this fight's fine. I don't think you have to play it. Um, I think that people feel they have to play it, though, because they've analyzed it to death. And then the last fight we're going to talk about, it's also kind of another middleweight fight, is the uh, Loic Rajabal versus Mateus Rubeski. Rubeski, I think you pronounce it. And you have two guys that are that that you know combination of of of, of wrestling and and striking, and I think it's a kind of a fair line. I mean, you have you have Rajakov is like uh, excuse me, uh, Rubeski is like minus one fifty, so I expect to see about eighty five, eighty six hundred. That's what you're getting here. You're getting Rubeski. Where is he? Uh, uh, yep, eighty four hundred versus seventy eight hundred. And both fighters have grappling upside here. You know, like Rajakov, Raj, uh, Rajabov, whatever. In his last fight, he had 11 takedowns. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that's, that's good. Um, and he gets takedowns in some of his regional fights, too. And then you have, um, what's his name? Uh, Rebeski, who, what do you have? Two or three takedowns last? He had, he had three takedowns in his first UFC fight. And he's got takedowns in some of these others. I think Rebeski might have better striking, but I mean, that's just more for, for eternal breakdowns, more for like longer breakdowns. Well, let's take a look at the inside the distance props here. You have, well, Rebeski inside the distance about a plus 230, which is fine. You know, it's not like, like Trevor Peak or anything like that, but it's fine. And then you have Razumov inside the distance. It's like plus like 6 million. So that, that's, that's no good. But... His path to victory, I so I was about to say he's, I still think he's a great play because all of his wins are going to involve a lot of takedowns and be optimal. I don't exactly, not exactly sure that's that's accurate. And I do think that there that there are variations to this fight where this stays literally stays on the feet the whole time. I do. So in GPPs, like I would not make a rule to have one of these two fighters. Like, if you get to them, fine, but I would not make a rule to have... They're both... Listen, I, I could see either of these fighters getting the fight they want and and scoring 100. I find it harder to believe that that Loic can do that, though. I think Loic's ceiling is closer to 90, where I think Rebeski is, is, can actually get finished and stuff like that and get over 100. So I guess I do kind of prefer Rebeski um, in DFS here, only because it's such a huge slate. Like, if this were a 12-fight slate or 11-fight slate, I think you'd score, score a half to play Rajivov because if he wins, you're looking at probably 80 to 90 points. Um, but at, at 14 fights, I don't think that's going to do it. So um, that's pretty much my whole breakdown, guys. I mean, it's, it's a really, really tough card. But it's a lot. It's really, really fun. If I guess if I had to summarize, um, I would say that the peak fight is something you really have to target. I think that one of these three, or maybe two of these three, between Brundage Dumas, Lane Taffa, and Alan Silva, I think all three of those. Uh, I think you probably want to play one of those. One of those, if not two of them. And then these mid-range, these other mid-range fights, I think are tempting. Maybe that's the key is to fade those somehow. And as far as as, as live underdogs, again, you know, uh, uh, Dumas from that key fight, you have um, Mariscal. Well, it's not really an underdog. You have, um, I think Josh Van could be kind of a fun little underdog there. And then Terman, not really. Maybe Rowe. I think Rowe's going to be extremely low owned. So maybe Rowe could be an interesting low owned underdog. Silva, obviously. Onama, just not quite. And then you just kind of proceed from there. Um, really, really fun card. Uh, I will be updating ownerships as we get uh, closer. I just don't have, I just think that's really not tight at all yet. And I'll update projections as well. But as you guys know, it's not MMA DFS is not really 
the greatest projection based sport. I mean, so many of the results, there's, 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 there's no median. You know what I mean? Like, like some see some of these median projections, they're, they're medians, but they're not, it's a number that no one's getting. You know what I mean? Like I saw like Trevor Peak has a 56, like, like a 62 projection. And that's, he's literally never getting 62 points in this fight. You know, he's either getting like 110 or like, or like, or like 20, you know what I mean? Or whatever. So anyway, uh, that should do it. Keep in mind, it's 1130 a.m. start time. Watch for my uh, DF, watch for my betting breakdown and uh, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody.